um, uh, actions, uh, indigenous knowledges, and 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 looks to um, engage with these theories uh, in relation to thinking about some of the sorts of challenges that we are confronted with, uh, bringing different disciplines, different orientations into conversations um, across countries um, um, as uh, we we as as we. As, as we navigate some of the multiple crises that have collided um, in current times. So we brought together a panel um, of people from different places um, and with different sorts of interests, but with much um, in common. So I will go through um, and introduce each person um, and uh, as they speak, and people will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, then we will have um, questions and discussion between the panel. Um, and we'll also invite people to make uh, comments or ask questions. So, so people can um, use also the question uh, and answer uh, functionality and Zoom and pop in questions there and we'll come back to those um, as we go. So our first speaker um, today is um, Professor Tony Birch. Um, and Tony um, is author of three novels, the best selling the White Girl, winner of the 2020 New South Wales Premier, Premier's Award for Indigenous Writing and shortlisted for the 2020 Miles Franklin Literary Prize Coast River, winner of the 2016 uh, Victorian Premier's Literary Award of Indigenous Writing and Blood, uh, which was also shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Award. And in addition to this, Tony um, worked at Victoria University and was uh, had a fellowship, senior fellowship, research fellowship there, and had a strong focus on um, climate justice and indigenous knowledge. So I'm going to invite Tony to make his remarks first. Um, thank you very much, Chris. And um, firstly, I want to um, obviously um, pay my respects to the land that I'm on. So I'm actually um, in Carlton at the moment in inner Melbourne. So I'm on the um, land of the Wurundjeri Nation. And I want to pay my respects to Wurundjeri people, elders past and present. I also want to pay my respects to people at VU who are on Bunurong land where I worked for five years in, a, in an academic fellowship. So probably it's best easiest to give you a sense of where I'm at in relationship to what I did for five years. And certainly if it's in 10 minutes, I'm not going to be able to say a lot, but I think what I learned and what I concluded within that fellowship is very important to think about this session in relationship to my contribution, but also in relationship to, to where I um, see myself going from here. So as Chris alluded to, I'm, I'm, I'm known as a, as a novelist and a poet and a short story writer, but I worked primarily as an academic for about 25 years and originally as a historian. So I did a PhD in history and taught at Melbourne University and I was invited um, very generously by Victoria University to undertake a five-year professorial fellowship at the um, second half of um, 2015. And I completed that fellowship on the 30th of June um, this year. So I'm officially retired, um, I suppose is the best way to describe myself. So this may be my last academic um, performance. Um, what I want to talk about in the little time that I've got is really that um, how my how I shifted my thinking in the five years. So when I began, I had a clear sense that clearly the importance of thinking about climate justice and the protection of country and the protection of ecologies was vital with giving respect to um, indigenous understandings of place and land. But at the outset, or originally, I think I was focused you know, on the notion of climate change how we might tackle it, looking at the relationship between science and traditional ecological knowledge, um, you know, TEK, and also looking at the disrespect really given to Aboriginal people on mainland Australia and to Torres Strait Islander people who had, of course, had their, their um, relationship with country so severely disrupted after invasion and that um, country has suffered greatly ecologically as a result of really um, improper practices of development um, under colonial um, agriculture and other forms of development such as mining. The other issue of course is that the displacement of indigenous people from country has left country in a really debilitated state and lacking that ongoing relationship with, with Aboriginal people, both in you know, story and narrative and certainly in relationship to, to maintenance and, and care of country. 
And I think that, you know, one of the things that I've learned, which, you know, in a way you think should be more obvious, and I hope is obvious to people now, is that we don't have an equal relationship with country. I actually think we need to privilege country so that I see us um, as Indigenous people having to serve and value country so that rather than trying to present an argument, you know, do we really, um, this is in the greater scheme of things for, for a country like the Australian nation, do we um, give enough respect to country? Well, obviously we don't, but more Sorry, there's a funny thing coming up on my screen. Um, that ensures that we... Tony, can you unmute? I think you're muted. But I'm not muted on my... No, it keeps um, cutting out on you. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's happening because... I haven't had any problem from my end on this at all ever. Okay, we'll um, see how you go again. And I'm right next to the machine. Yeah, what's it called? The the sort of the thing okay. in the cupboard. Okay, so um, we'll see what happens. So where I'm at now, and I did circulate a couple of articles. And one was um, one of those sort of moments in your life, which are a brief but extremely for me profound. I had gone to Turtle Island to Canada. And I was at the Banff Centre, which people may know the Banff Environmental Centre. And um, I had been reading about the terrible destruction of um, First Nations communities in, in Canada in a way that was very familiar to me coming from Australia. So the, the issues of primary um, knowledge that I learned there were certainly about um, the, the year I was there was the 150th celebration of Canada. And I had learned that, you know, 150,000 um, First Nations children had been stolen from their families over that period and placed in the terrible dormitory and reform systems. And you're talking here about a thousand children a year for 150 years. I was reading about the Royal Commission into the murder of Aboriginal women and, and girls in Canada. And again, that was such a familiar story when you think about the violence um, that Aboriginal women have suffered in Australia. So I felt a, a terrible sense of familiarity and, and to be honest, a, a real sense of despair of thinking about this. And then one night I was going for a walk along the river and um, I was feeling this quite palpably. And then I kept thinking, well, this is, this is what the Canadian nation has done for First Nations people. This is a colonial act of violence. So I was focusing on, I suppose, what we might think, you know, the white nation of Canada, which might seem appropriate. But then I stopped and I was looking across the river and I thought, why am I thinking about um, which country I'm in, as in Canada, rather than whose country I am on? Whose country I am on? We, whose First Nation country am I standing on at the moment contemplating this violence? And it became a really important shift in my, not so much my thinking, but my sense of well-being, that it was empowering to shift away from a state of focusing on colonial violence to thinking about the tenacity of um, First Nations resilience. So that, it again, I know that sounds obvious and it's something that we should all be aware of, but I, I had forgotten that basic, that basic premise and it shifted not only the way that I thought about the rest of my trip there, but certainly in relationship to it being empowering for me to move forward with my, my research. And the second issue, and probably the most pertinent for myself personally, has been, I suppose, what's happened toward the um, conclusion of the um, fellowship. And it's in one of the other articles that I circulated. So that um, I went for a terrible experience now, 18 months ago, the death of my, my younger brother. And um, one of the things that I found out soon after his death is that I, I felt a need to revisit sites, you know, places of our childhood that we shared together. And they're primarily along the river in Melbourne called the Birrarung or what people may know as the Yarra River. And I felt that by doing a, a series of walks, and when I say a series of walks, I mean doing walks every day for, for, for several months and I'm, I'm still engaged with that part of the river. And I felt that what was vital to me was to connect with country, to be on country, and to not only engage with, with, with land, engage with 
country, but really understand the deep history of the country that I live on, the Indigenous country that, that I feel a very strong affinity to. And that leads, I suppose, to, to my provocation for myself and thinking about how I want to go forward with, with my, my writing on this issue and my, my, my engagement with this issue, is that one of the things that has been, um, and any Indigenous person, by the way, in this room today will understand this, you know, one of the things that um, you get asked often and time and time again is, oh, well, how can non-Aboriginal people, how can white people, settler people, no country in the same way that Aboriginal people do? It's a question that is, it's never stopped people asking it. And I think it's the wrong question. Um, it's entirely the wrong question because the understanding of your relationship to country as an Indigenous person is very different than that of a settler person and they can never be and shouldn't be um, mutually accommodated. Having said that, I, I don't want to say that with a lack of generosity or a lack of insight and a lack of the potential for collaboration and um, cooperation. And I think my, my feeling about it is pretty simple, is that it's like my experience of Turtle Island, is that I was so destabilized there because I had no foundation. I had no sense of knowing where I was in the sense of the deep time stories of Indigenous people, absolutely no sense. So what I, I feel is important is that for, for all people is that you must know the country that you're on. You must learn the history of the country you're on. You must engage with the, the, the wisdom of Indigenous stories, narratives, experience, care of country. And I think once you engage and give respect to those foundations, then the second issue is what then is your experience of that? So rather than um, for settler people to say and ask, how can we know this country the way the Indigenous people do, my response would be firstly, educate yourself and educate yourself in a respectful and proper manner. And then in concert with doing that, and I know, when I say in concert with doing that, I see for all of this, this is a lifetime project. This is not something that, you know, you don't do a course on this for three weeks or three months. It's it's about learning for life about the values and deep time of the land that we're, we're living on and visiting. And then I think the second part of that is then what, what is your experience of that place? What How do you live in that place? How do you remember your own experiences? Because what I feel is that by giving respect to Indigenous narrative of place and Indigenous history of place, that is what you, we all should do. Um, so when we visit other countries, we should do that. Um, by the way, I know there's a couple of people here from, from a couple of Maori scholars. Um, one of the things that I've been doing recently, I've been really fortunate to, to look at some remarkable material coming out in relationship to Maori um, relationship to water, both seawater and freshwater. And while there are similarities to Indigenous experience here in Australia, one of the um, one of the fortunate outcomes of that is that I'm also learning new ways of, of thinking about place by listening to and um, engaging with the way that other Indigenous peoples around the world think about their relationship to place. And I think that the Maori relationship to water is a wonderful way of thinking about our commitment to place and our respect for place. So in other words, we're all on a journey, I think of lifetime education. And my five years has taught me that we're in a desperate situation regarding climate change. And there are things that need to be done yesterday. Yeah, we are experiencing a climate emergency in many parts of the world, particularly um, at the moment, um, indigenous people who are facing rising sea levels around the Pacific, for instance. But I also feel in conclusion that we need generational change. We need to shift our philosophical understanding of our relation. This is as, a na as nations to, as I said earlier, to actually give privilege to country and to be humble, to be humble people who, who understand that um, we should be gratefully subordinate to the rights of country. You know, a, gr a great friend of mine, an activist, um, Robbie Thorpe, when he talks about land rights, He's not, he says, it's not about our land rights, it's the rights of land. We have to respect the rights of country. And I think if we, we do that, then we are equipped to, to have the ability to change the way, um, particularly in the West, change the way that we're currently allowing country to be um, destroyed and desecrated. 
Okay, thank you. I'll finish, Chris. <laughs> thank you, Tony. I've got, I've got, I've got terrible sound issues. I don't know. I'm being, uh, <clears throat> I'm being challenged this morning with this. I hope people can hear me right now. Um, th thank you, Tony. Those are really, really powerful uh, remarks, and I'm, I'm always. Um, um, challenged and encouraged by the provocations that you that you offer um, as we think about some of these sorts of deep challenges and I think um, foundationally around some of the sorts of ways in which we've been socialized to understand and think about ourselves and our relationships with each other, place, uh, climate and so forth. So I, I, I really look forward to, to, to hear how people engage with the provocations that you've offered. Um, but we'll go on to the, the, um, the next person to offer some of her remarks. And my friend and colleague, uh, Mariolga Reyes Cruz, uh, who's sitting in uh, Puerto Rico, um, um, is, is joining us this morning. And Mariolga and I have worked together, I don't know, for, for more than 10 years. I think we've, we've it's actually longer than that, but um, I'm happy to welcome her and um, say that Marialga is a, a Puerto Rican community psychologist, ethnographer, and documentarist engaged in efforts to build power for social um, and climate justice from decolonial and eco-feminist perspectives. And I think some of what Marialga has to offer um, builds and connects nicely with uh, what to how Tony has introduced our session. So Marialga, welcome. Hi. Um... Thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to, to be with you, even, even though I wish I was there <laughs> with you. Um, yeah, I'm talking from Puerto Rico or Borigen, as the Taino people called it. This is the land of the Taino people. And um, I, um, I wanted to talk about the climate crisis, um, departing from maybe an assumption, a wrong assumption about our audience, but I'm, I'm gonna put it out there anyway, because um, I have become a climate activist more recently than, than I've been a community psychologist, particularly after the past of the hurricanes Irma and Maria to Puerto Rico that devastated, uh, devastated our country. And, um, and as I try to engage in this conversation in Puerto Rico, I, I realized that it's, it's very difficult to talk about climate justice when even with people who are long time social justice activists and, and advocates. And as I looked into what community psychology has done on these issues, I found the same thing. We had a, a special issue uh, the beginning of the, uh, I think it was 2011. And, uh, and from what the, the editors of that, that issue were, were saying, it was actually hard to get people to write about it. And the most recent issue that was um, published this year had a little bit of the same feeling, um, particularly what our colleague, uh, Donata Francescato, I'm not sure if I'm saying her, her name correctly, what um, was saying in, in her article. So I want to talk about the climate crisis and what does that mean for community psychology? Um, as you all know, the community psychology was forged during the second half of the 20th century in the metaphorical burning fires of social justice. As a field, we have come a long way. We have contributed to shed light on hidden and silent social issues, understood better the systems that produce injustice, help alleviate suffering, generate community power from below. And yet today we are faced with unprecedented levels of inequality, both globally and locally. Um, as Ox, the, the organization Oxfam International reports, the richest 1% has accumulate, have accumulated twice as much wealth as 90% of the global population. The 22 richest men in the world have more wealth than all the women in Africa. The unpaid care work done by women is three times the size of the tech industry, but the work goes unpaid. And only three, I mean, only four cents in every dollar of tax revenue comes from taxes on wealth. In Puerto Rico, 
uh, Boriquen, which is an archipelago in the Caribbean, land of the Taino people, colonial territory of the United States, poverty has a stronghold and it has been that way for at least ha uh, five decades. Even though the GDP has grown consist consistently for the last 50 years, half of our population lives under poverty. And actually half of our municipalities live with 60 or more percent of their population under poverty. We know the, that inequality is the product of historical and systemic process, processes rooted in patriarchy, colonization, racism, and the capitalist world system. Yet we are not addressing the capitalist world system. What we as community psychologists do to alleviate and address some of its consequences, um, but do not profoundly change the systems of inequality in itself. So I have to, uh, we have to think about this, not just be in, in, in a, as part of an ongoing conversation with, within the field, but actually in the, in the moment of the climate crisis because we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction of life in the planet. And this is the first extinction humanity witnesses and is responsible for. So the levels of global and local inequality are deepened by unprecedented, these levels of inequality are going to be deepened, are being deepened by the unprecedented changes in the earth um, biosphere. This presents a threat that um, Kumi Naidu, Secretary General of Amnesty International asserts will compound, magnify existing inequalities and its effects will continue to grow and worsen over time, creating ruin for current and future generations. That is, if we don't mobilize now climate justice, as Greta Thunberg insists, we have to act like our house is on fire because it is. So the consensus among the international community is that it is our activity that has increased the emissions in greenhouse gases to such an extent that it is causing the significant global warming, living, escaping, surviving, significant increases in temperature, as Heather mentioned in the opening of the conferences, the melting of the glaciers, sea level rise. As I said, I live in an island country. 60% of our population live in the coast. Ocean acidification and increased temperatures affect the ecosystems that are barriers to the sea level rise. So our lives are being threatened by this crisis. In, in 2018, the inter, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change published a report where it warns that we have barely a decade, this decade, to take radical actions that would bring about profound changes in our societies to reduce global greenhouse gas emission by half before 2030 and eliminate emissions entirely by 2015. In 20, I'm sorry, in 2050. In 2050, my child, is gonna be 36 years old. So this fight is for us, for the next generation and for the future generations. Now, the climate crisis is of our own making but not all humans have contributed to create and exacerbate global warming. And so this is it's important to acknowledge it. Just a hundred companies are responsible for 70% of greenhouse emissions. 10 countries are responsible for 64 greenhouse emissions. So in a country like mine, for example, I, I run into, into people on that we will consider allies to say, well, you know, what, what, how, what does, how Puerto Ricans have anything to do with global warming? We're not producing the gas emissions. And to that, we have to think about how we are living. In Puerto Rico, we import 85% of the food that we consume. It comes from other places. It not only travels, but it uses the resources of other lands, water, land, people. 
the same with everything else that we use because our economy is not based on producing what we need here is based on producing things that other people can import and so that we import other countries ex exports so um in order to be able to um Place ourselves in this crisis. I think that we also need to run history. We have honored yeah. taking care of her as she cycles and time scale. The conquest of the Americas over 500 years ago initiated a process of extraction accumulation at a massive scale, extraction and exploitation of people and nature that transformed the ways of doing, being, and knowing with nature in nature. The Industrial Revolution that began in, in Great Britain in, in the 18th century accelerated this process across Europe, Asia, and the American continent. Since then, greenhouse gas emissions have increased 50-fold. This is the last 150 years of our existence in this planet. A reporter once asked Mahatma Gandhi if he would like India to enjoy the same standard of living that Great Britain had. To which Gandhi responded that in order for a small country like, like Britain to enjoy its way of life, it had to exploit half of the planet. How many planets would India have to exploit to enjoy the same standard of living Great Britain had? That is a question that we all have to ask ourselves. So we are at a crossroads, crossroads. There are no magical technological solutions that could stop the warming of the planet. Actually, if anybody's trying to sell you technical solutions, you'd be very suspect about it because any technical de technological development is based on extraction of mother earth. There is no economic growth without the exploitation of nature and people. So we need to rethink about what we mean about um, with having a good life because every, every economic system, every um, apuesta, sorry, I'm going to mix the little languages here, to grow and as a way of being better, living better, is based on the exploitation of others, including mother, mother nature. To confront this existential crisis, we need to recognize it as a systemic crisis of the capitalist Western world. As Amaya Perez Orozco, Yayo Herrero, and other ecofeminists insist, we need to recognize that we are eco-dependent. We cannot exist without the ecosystems of the earth. We are tied to her fate. We're vulnerable. Life is precarious. Life is only possible if we care for it, if we take care of each other, if we are and recognize our interdependence. Perhaps the COVID pandemic has taught us a little bit about that. That is why we need to place the sustainability of life at the center of our actions, understanding, amplifying and supporting grassroots alternatives to the capitalist system the logic of production and extractivism and the systems that sustain it, patriarchy, racism, anthropocentrism, coloniality. Again, as Amaya Perez Orozco asserts, we're not opening here a debate on revolution versus reform. We are already in transit to something else. The question is, what road are we taking? Are we taking the road to eco-fascism or are we taking new paths towards societies built on solidarity among humans and all other living beings and, and the, the living and world that depends on, on mother earth, on, of mother earth. Not, not all is li living. Such alternatives are already here. Nature-based solutions to climate change could create many, many, many good jobs that then do capitalist expansion. 
I'm talking from agroecology to the protection and restoration of natural systems to building all the systems of care that we know that are needed but are not recognized or paid for. That goes from education, taking care of people, taking care of others, um, taking care of nature. Degrowth is an exit strategy for living within the limits of the regenerative capacities of the ecosystems. Redistribution of socioeconomic resources, resources is a key to, to this approach so that more and more people can enjoy personal sufficiency and public luxury. Why do we, everybody has to have every, everything of every single thing, right? What about having sharing uh, economies of all different kinds so that we can meet each other, share with each other, extend the life of what is already here without exploding, exploiting Mother Earth and the people and people. This is, uh, this is una apuesta to abundance of time and relationships. Another, another uh, path that is already open is the expansion of the commons and communing, community land trust, housing and agricultural co-ops, the sharing economy. So what could be the role of CP in all of this? We need a shift in focus, a radical shift in focus. How do we contribute to social justice in the midst of the climate justice? This climate exacerbates the injustices that we are trying to address. It's going, it's, it's, um, it's deepening and expanding inequality, massive migration and expulsion of people from their, their lands. We need many, many more people entering the struggle for climate justice head on, working with others to generate and create alternatives to the climate crisis that are sustainable and fair, reconfiguring our relationship to nature and one another, building and promoting ecosystems of solidarity, understanding, promoting and strengthening ecologies of knowledges on how to live better, more abundantly with less consumption engaging and transforming our political culture so that we can make decisions at the local level that have ramifications and the, in the political systems locally and globally. We need to reimagine empower, reimagine empower to generate political power. So I'm gonna leave it like this. At, at this point, I, I have no idea how much time I'm taking, Chris, but uh, I'm sure we're, I, I wanna have, um, space so that we can have uh, a very animated conversation about this and other issues. Thank, thank, thank you, Maria Olga. I hope my sound is uh, a little bit better. Um, if not, then I'm yeah. sort of um, <laughs> in strife right now. Thank you for those uh, comments, Maria Olga. Quite, quite wide ranging. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think the, the sorts of ways in which you are, are pointing to the um, the links to capitalism, the, the need to historicize and understand the way in which particular sets of things have been set in motion and continue to be reproduced is, um, is really important. But I think that that other ideology that you point out, I, I think um, that also connects really nicely with, with what, uh, what Tony has uh, said is, I mean, how do we reconfigure our relationship, not only with other humans, but I think with, with nature, I think is so central and a vital task for psychology. But um, I'll move on now to, to introduce our next um, um, two speakers who have uh, graciously accepted our invitation to, uh, to stand in for our other colleague, uh, Mohi Rua. And I really appreciate that the two of them um, can join from, um, from their collective um, over in New Zealand. So we have um, Dr. Darren Hodgetts, a professor of societal psychology at the University of uh, Massey University. And Darren identifies as a Pākehā New Zealander with filial ties to the Nai Tahu. Um, and joining Darren um, is Dr. Peter King, who is a lecturer of the School of Psychology at Massey New Zealand. He is a Maori uh, Pākehā dis descendant, um, hailing from the Northern New Zealand tribe of the Te Rarawa. Is that, is that right, Peter? So Darren and Peter, um, 
uh, please uh, make your remarks. Uh, kia ora, Chris. Thank you for that um, kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to the conference organisers for um, our collective to speak at this event. Um, you'll see when we pop a slide up, hopefully you can see it now. Um, we're speaking on behalf of a research collective that spans three universities um, and the stuff we're going to talk about is collective work. It's not just from Pitarai or with Mohi. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge that our university is located on Ngāti Whātua's land, and we're going to touch on some of our work that we've been involved in with them as well um, along the way. What we've opted to do today um, is just to touch on some of the cultural concepts and philosophical ideas that we've been developing to understand our immersion in community coalitions to address issues such as homelessness, uh, family violence, precarity, um, generally defined, and sustainable livelihoods. We've been doing work on things like living wages and so on, and working quite closely with unions around some of that work. Um, our filling in with Mohi today actually reflects our relational ethics of mutual support, solidarity, trust, and responsiveness um, that's central to the approach that we want to touch on um, today and that we've been evolving um, as, as a community of scholars. Now, we work a lot with visual and tactile methods, particularly when we're working with um, precariatized communities. So the images on these slides as we go through will offer some insights um, into this work. And as such, for us, community praxis is like jumping out of a plane together, not really knowing where we're going to land, not really knowing who we're going to meet along the way, and what opportunities for change might arise. Now, we would argue that we need to embrace this uncertainty and not plan it out in order to be responsive, to be able to listen, and to remain open to adjusting our projects in real time, particularly when what Lewin referred to as unfreezing moments occur in which we can change social systems and so on. And we'll touch on a couple of examples of that work um, today. Now, what guides us are relational ethics and the community skills that we actually brought with us to psychology. And a lot of this work, and particularly the community-based knowledge production, we've actually had to unlearn our methods training, to unlearn this distal approach that dominates our discipline and kind of removes us from community engagements and makes us end up kind of acting a bit like robots who don't really fit into the environment. So we try and immerse ourselves with others and what's going on and then produce knowledge from that. Now, with that being said, once you move into that space, the guiding principle for knowledge production, which we're operating according to, is relationships first, research second. If the time's not right to talk and do research, then we'll wait. And we'll wait until people are ready and so on. So this is an image of this approach in action. Um, this is based on a gardening project, which Peter will talk to and actually um, completed his master's thesis on. And what we like about this image is you can't really tell who's an academic, who's a member of Ngāti Whātua, the hosting iwi, or who's a homeless person. And for us, that's a really, really good thing. And what it is, is we've been working in the garden, in a gardening kind of project for about, um, or four or five months, and we were overlooking a harbour, and it's a beautiful vista. And what we just and people were talking about fishing, so we used our research money to charter boat, and we went fishing. And spending that day together opened up a whole lot of opportunities for dialogue that may not have necessarily happened. And this is the importance we talk about of micro moments, um, in which we can actually explore issues together and do research with people rather than conducting it on people. Um, which is what we were trained to do um, in our various degrees. So we would argue that a socially just approach to homelessness or the other social issues that we're working with draws on the knowledge and experiences that are germane to the groups with whom we collaborate. And so when we're working in a marae place or a traditional meeting place with the people that you see in this image, that means behaving in a way that's appropriate to that place rather than how we're taught to behave as researchers. The other issue here is that we don't engage in poverty tourism. Um, there's been far too much of that in our discipline um, at the moment. And we have obligations towards principled practice and relational ethics to ensure issues around moral inclusion and procedural fairness. And this is the stuff we're kind of writing about at the moment. So it's applied, it's engaged, but it's philosophically informed. 
Now, relational ethics is a bit different to a lot of the conversations in our discipline around epistemology and ontology and other ideas. And it's really about why is knowledge produced and how was it acted upon? And we have a special issue uh, coming out in theory and psychology on some of this stuff, looking at could we replace the default uh, first philosophical principle of our discipline, which seems to be epistemology, with relational ethics? And what would a discipline look like if it was based on a notion of ethics rather than a notion of what is the nature of knowledge? This also requires researchers to act from our hearts and minds and acknowledge our interpersonal bonds to others. And we actually embrace those bonds and try and cultivate them rather than try and be standoffish and objective. And to take responsibility for our actions and the consequences of them, particularly when we're advocating on behalf of groups or with groups or working for change. Now this also embraces some of the local interdisciplinary literature, which is really talking about transformative praxis from a Maori perspective. Um, and that researchers can conducted with expectations that it will benefit the groups with whom one is working. Um, and so along those lines, we've been thinking about what we've been doing in relation to some key cultural concepts that sit within tikanga Māori. Uh, so building on what Darren was mentioning earlier around uh, unlearning ethics um, and the gardening project where I did my master's research uh, about eight years ago, um, an interesting story sort of uh, um, that I'm going to tell to help conceptualize how we use these cultural concepts within our research. Um, so the, the gardening project was the first um, uh, large uh, Māori and psychology research unit project that I was a part of. Um, and what was interesting there is that there was kind of a weird moment when we were on the marae where my colleagues took me aside to have a bit of a conversation. Um, and that conversation was, a, was about reiterating the point, having come through my undergrad and my honours, that um, I'd been raised Māori and I knew how to interact with Māori on the marae um, in ways that make sense culturally. And that simply I just needed to stop being weird. And what I mean by stop being weird is that um, quite often people from minoritized communities will go off into universities, they learn all these fancy techniques, and then they go back to their own communities and start, and without even kind of thinking of it, start imposing these ways of interacting with their own communities at the detriment of their own culturally nuanced and appropriate ways of engaging. So on a deeper level, um, me not being weird was um, spoke to this importance of needing to unlearn aspects of our training um, so that we engage with our communities um, in ways that just make sense. Um, now in saying that, um, one of the, the tricky things there is that what, what it means to make sense is, is often, a, is often a, an implicit thing. And so what this has forced us to do as a research group is to explicitly articulate the cultural concepts that are being invoked when we work with communities because um, as I'm sure many Indigenous peoples um, here know, you don't kind of get sat down and told you're an Indigenous person that they are X, Y, Z um, cultural values and that this is how you do it. You kind of just get raised organically in these communities and you just know how to engage. Um, but we can't, and you know, being international scholars, we can't just um, use the you know statements or this is how it is. We really have to push to try and explicitly articulate these cultural concepts. And uh, as you can see on the slide that we've got here, um, and unfortunately, Mohi can't be with us, but he's the one who's really been driving um, the, the theorizing and the making explicit, making that implicit explicit um, in terms of communicating the sort of approach that we take. Um, so as you'll see, the first concept is whanaungatanga, which is um, kinship-like network. So it's about building and maintaining relationships and valuing relationships first and foremost. So as researchers, what this means is that when we go to places like the marae, um, first and foremost, we go as, as Indigenous peoples who are there to engage with other people. Um, the research component um, is kind of put to the side, and if we get to it, that's awesome. But if we don't get to it, um, that's okay, because what we don't want to do is, is to uh, compromise those whanangatanga links that we're trying to um, build as scholars. And as you can see in these images on the side, um, here's one of the key homeless scholars. His name was Togo. And um, I'm just sitting there planting some, um, some pumpkin, pumpkins with them. And now uh, we did this sort of work. We just showed up to the Mariah Gardens and, and planted with these guys and just had conversations. And um, for about six months before any uh, formal interviews um, were taking place. And this is important because this guy who you can see here, this is the same fella sitting with uh, one of the crowers playing the guitar, never takes, place, uh, never takes part in any um, evaluations or um, research or 
any of these sorts of things. People have been trying to talk to him for years. And one of the reasons why we were able to talk to him is because we spent six months up on the marae in ways that made sense culturally for Māori, as we are Māori. Um, and then one day after lunch, um, this karaua here, Tini Te Fetu, who was a central part of our research, just sat up and said, okay, let's go do an interview. And they just walked off into the bush and an interview took place. And many people back at the Auckland City Mission were quite taken aback by how simple it seemed we were able to get the interview, but it wasn't simple because we fronted up for six months uh, going into that. Uh, there's also a concept here called haka iti, and this links to some of the points that Tony was making around humility, particularly around um, you know, gardening practices as a, as a way of engaging with the environment. Um, you know, these aren't just uh, Māori men gardening, the, um, these are Māori men enacting culturally patterned ways of engaging with the environment. One of the key points I think that also links across to Māori, Māori Olga um, and what she was saying is the points around taking care of nature because one of the key points that came out of this research was the idea of what, what, what you do to the land is what you do to yourself. So you can't care for yourself if you're not caring for the land. And if you're destroying the land, what does that actually mean for you? And so these are some of the cultural concepts that have been really important for us in developing our ways of working. Uh, Humaria is also a really um, important part here is um, acting with kindness and gentleness. Quite often, I think um, we can kind of get caught up in our sterile ways of working, um, but it's really important to kind of just sit down, take time, um, not let the research be the center of our engagements and just treat people with, um, with that sort of humanity that we'd hope everyone else extends to each other. Um, and in terms of Po Whirinaki, I'll pass back to Darren because um, he's got a long story about uh, a guy over at Auckland City Mission who was very central in setting up this project and uh, moving it forward. Just, but just before I talk to that concept, if you see at the bottom image there, there's a barbecue. <clears throat> and the reason that barbecue is there as an image and is important is manakitanga isn't just a mm. psychological construct in the mental kind of relational sense, mm. it becomes material. So Ngāti Whātua was so keen to be humane and to host the local homeless population who don't have necessarily have ancestral mm. ties to them, that they built a red brick barbecue and it's available for the 20 four seven to go up there cook a meal and be in a marae space and this is really important when homeless maori people in auckland talk about when they're in the settler society that's a landscape of despair mm. when they're in this marae space which is central to the to the city they're in a space for care and recovery and and are part of the reconciliation of that land mm. so we shouldn't miss the material aspects of these concepts that they become very real mm. uh, the concept of po that put is talking about really goes to what i was talking about in terms of we can't anticipate opportunities and moments that arise and in building uh, a um, meaningful relationship with the reverend wolf holt from the anglican mission in the in the city which we worked with for 20 years over 20 years now he created, as a Māori man, a whole bunch of opportunities, opened this space with us and was central to setting it up. And part of the project and, and our reciprocating with him was he had a board who weren't so keen on homeless people just going gardening, what's the point of that? Didn't understand it culturally. So part of our role was to document that and to say with homeless people, you don't necessarily need these things called interventions and evaluations. It's a very mechanistic way of thinking about these things. What we need is modes of engagement, spaces of care, and then things kind of can take care of themselves. So we really engaged with that. What we, when we started looking at Wolf and others like Rolinda Karapu from Māori Women's Refuge, we started developing this idea that to work effectively with communities to help with their sustainability and to address issues of poverty and exclusion, we really need to work with the PO or the, the pillars of strength or the stalwarts that already exist there and grow their capacity and support rather than disrupt them. So a lot of our work has been really working with the PO to support, to document and to resource so that communities can start developing their own sustainability and autonomy and so on. And so this comes with a proverb that we work from, he toka tu moana, the rock of stability that dissipates the ocean's force. This idea that things are coming in, a lot of crap's happening, you've got police, all these other things going on in many of these communities. And there's always that, or often, if we have a community rather than a neighborhood, 
you have Po Prison. And these are the places where kids can go to if they get into trouble and who will broker the relationships with parents, the police and so on with the children. So it makes sense to work with these people in order, in, in the ways that these concepts elaborate in order to grow the shared capacity. So it becomes a joint exercise that's grounded in community life rather than a bunch of academics showing up with um, some harebrained schemes, I guess. So just on this final slide, what we've done is come around and a lot of our work exists in the community, but it doesn't just stay there. And that when we engage in networks with the Reverend Holt, with different community groups, with our colleagues and so on, opportunities arise for action and change. And these opportunities arise at the, at the personal level around service responses to particular homeless people, for example, um, at, at the institutional level in terms of how is that service like the mission engaging with the indigenous population in its catchment area, but also at structural levels around professional groups such as judges, uh, medical doctors, but also policy work. So if I think about the first example here, what we did is we didn't just document the misery of lives of homelessness. What we actually did is took what we learned in cases and then worked with the support workers who were working with them to say, how can we practice differently? Is there a way of changing the way the organization sets up its crisis team and so on? And by doing this based on the experiences of the people who are actually accessing those services, we were able to effect some change um, and actually have some fun and build some relationships along the way. The garden project, as I mentioned beforehand, is a classic example of looking at how services start developing different responses to these social issues and ones that are culturally textured in ways that are meaningful and will actually engage the client groups in ways that are acceptable to them rather than just imposing some things on them. And then what we've also had, had is the opportunity to engage a lot with city councils who often from time to time, particularly around election periods, try and ban homeless people from CBDs um, and to engage in that on behalf of and with the mission and with the night shelter in Hamilton and other places to really challenge those beliefs and to change some of those attempts to remove homeless people from the scope of justice and then engage in them with them in procedurally unfair ways. So really opening that dialogue and being brokers in it. I spent three years as a result of our research doing professional development training for the high and district court judges in New Zealand around poverty related offending and what would be just responses and strategies um, that reflect the life situations. It does not make any sense to find someone who doesn't have any money. They're just going to be back seeing you again. So, and that was an example of how doing this work and getting, getting a reputation for it opened up opportunities to then engage with professional groups that actually impact the lives of the people who have given us, or we are custodians of aspects of their knowledge. Also, we've written a policy think piece with Ngāpai Ōtumaramatanga, which is the Centre of Excellence for Māori Research in New Zealand, which is really an attempt to take some of these concepts and say, why don't we restructure our whole welfare system to reflect this way of working? Because then rather than become a penal welfare system of punishment for being poor, it actually becomes a social safety net that is embracing and caring of people and understands them in a different way as fellow human beings rather than denizens, um, for example. Now, a lot of this is also informed by international work. I'm thinking of Mohammed Sadat's writing on witnessing. Um, that's particularly powerful when we're working with professional groups like this and encouraging sondering or them to recognize marginalized communities as human beings again, because often in those discussions, we're talking about offenders or we have these abstract terms. So bringing the person back in, hence the use of a lot of visual and ethnographic methods in that process. And what we're trying to promote there, and, and this is drawing on Sadat's work again, is these acts of compassion where people and professionals can see themselves as compassionate informed human beings again, and act responsibly, particularly those who are wielding power over whether someone is incarcerated or not for mm -hmm. poverty related um, instances. And again, this is where the third human, hermeneutic comes in. So we tend to have a hermeneutic where a homeless person makes sense of their experiences. We as research in the classic double hermeneutic make sense of their sense, if you like, 
But it's also our role to take that into conversations with decision makers. And this is where a third hermeneutical space arises and where we again negotiate the meaning of a phenomena such as homelessness in that space. Mm. So as you can see, we've been quite eclectic in this work. We're trying to draw on indigenous concepts, literature out of Africa and Asia as well, as drawing on Western philosophical principles to try and weave together mm. a structure or a way of working and sustaining ourselves as a, as a scholarly community that is embedded in deprived or precariatized communities mm. in an attempt to try and affect change over decades. So one of the pieces we've written for a book Chris is um, actually editing is very much on the relationship between the Māori and Psychology Research Unit and Māori Women's Refuge that's been going now for 33 years. And how does that work culturally and what are the benefits of that? So I'm a second generation in that relationship, Pitt is a third generation in that relationship, and we hope that there are many more um, within those relationships. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Ah, oh, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Darren and, and Peter. That is um, really rich. I, I, I love the notion of principle, practice, and ethics as first principle uh, for for uh, thinking through some of this. And I know the the way in which you guys um, assemble your work that I mean that challenges and and generates new things across disciplinary boundaries, um, even and the way in which you are I know introducing and I think someone has commented. I mean a different language that is part of the relational ethics and humanizing. Of, of the work. So looking at fields um, of engagement as opposed to intervention, <laughs> interventions and instruments, uh, Wafa Shafiq has, has commented here. So um, so thank you for that. I look forward to the discussion that, that follows on, but um, I'll introduce the, the final um, uh, speaker for, for this um, so this part of the, the talk, uh, Professor um, Raywan um, Connell. Um, uh, formerly of University of Sydney, I think still, still is, and a life member of the National Tertiary Education Union. Uh, she has taught in several countries um, and is widely cited sociological researcher. Her recent book uh, include um, The Good University, a book that is titled in uh, Portuguese, and I'm going to uh, mangle this now, Genero en Termos Reas. Um, and Southern Theory and Gender in World Perspective um, with Rebecca Pierce. So um, welcome, Raywan, and um, I invite you to make your contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. And um, I hope we're coming through clearly in the, in the sound department. Good. Um, I'm speaking to you from the city of Sydney. Uh, which is built on the lands of the uh, Eora and Darug peoples. Uh, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and, and emerging. As uh, uh, Chris mentioned, I've worked very largely as a sociologist, but I actually had a formative encounter with psychology as an undergraduate way back in the dark ages in the 1960s, when I did a psychology major in my BA degree, it wasn't a bad program. We did the rats and stats that you have to do, um, but we also got a, a dose of Freud, um, a, more than a dose of Piaget, a bit of Bruner, so a more, developmental and uh, humanistic psychology was part of the story and also some so social psychology, which was a bit of a specialty in Australia at that time that has um, largely dissipated since, I think. Anyway, well, as you, you will probably recognize this curriculum and you will recognize that it took me a long time to recognize about uh, my own education, uh, that this reflected the, the dependent position of Australian universities in a global economy of knowledge. Basically, the people that we studied were psychologists uh, from uh, Western Europe and North America and, and practically no one else. 
Um, and that was characteristic of the universities of settler colonial society in the South Pacific, uh, in North America, in parts of what's now thought of as Latin America and Southern Africa. Um, we were taught as psychology, as science, um, a way of thinking that, that I now recognize as a result of my, my later education um, as a, a particular pattern of knowledge, what I call the research-based knowledge formation. It's a particular way of encountering and rec reckoning with the world and developing knowledge. It's a way that I respect and, and have used. Um, but I also now see it in a more um, critical way and, and in terms of its context. Research-based knowledge formation is not exactly Western knowledge, so it's often labeled that way. I think far more accurately, we have to see it as an imperial knowledge system because you know, what might otherwise be called Western science has actually depended for a very long time on knowledge from non-Western parts of the world. In fact, the whole colonized world and post-colonial world um, has functioned in this knowledge formation as a gigantic data mine where information is connected, is collected and then funneled back to the centers of the knowledge formation in the elite institutions of the global north. Now we're very familiar with this kind of pattern of, of knowledge making in the history of imperialism, the old history of, of sciences, biology, um, anthropology, physical sciences too, astronomy and so forth. Uh, but this still persists. If, if you look, for instance, carefully at the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which Marioka mentioned, and which are important documents, you'll still see this structure um, that the, the knowledge which is fed into the, those gigantic climate models to a very large extent is collected around the global south, around the post-colonial world, but is theorized and processed in the elite institutions of the global north. And when this kind of structure, this global inequality of uh, in, in, built in to the, the model of, of knowledge production, uh, is generalized across the human sciences, the natural sciences, biomedical science, physical sciences, as it is. It produces a very strange situation for people living in the majority world, which is, of course, outside the global north, uh, and for intellectual workers specifically in those areas. And uh, you know, this becomes acute in the social sciences and the human sciences where we living in the, the global periphery or uh, what, whatever you want to call the, the, the very complex and diverse parts of the world outside the, the global metropole. Um, we are invited through the mainstream knowledge formation, the dominant knowledge formation in the world to look at ourselves and our societies through the eyes of the global north, in effect, as if we were a, a 51st state of the United States or a, a lost county of England, but we're not. We're, you know, the products of 500 years of imperialism, our societies around the world and there are other forms of knowledge which may be in the long run as important or perhaps even more important than the research-based knowledge formation itself. Now we've already had, you know, been talking about some of these. We've talked about indigenous knowledge. We haven't really talked about 
Another important uh, knowledge framework that is alternative universalisms, such as Islamic knowledge formations. But all alternatives to the, the dominant knowledge formation have in fact been strongly affected by the, the shattering of communities and societies and cultures, which is a con con consequence of the the 500 years of conquest of exploitative colonial societies and the contemporary massively unequal um, global economy, which is in the background of so much that we're talking about today, as Tony and Marioga have, have emphasized. So looking for what other uh, sort of grounding we might find. I've become particularly interested in, in what I have called Southern theory, which is basically the intellectual responses to colonialism, to colonial society, to post-colonial situation that have been produced by intellectual workers around the global South, broadly defined. It seems to me that in this work, this, these creative responses to the experience of, of imperial societies, um, we have tremendous resources, cultural, intellectual resources that can be used for uh, responding to the kinds of challenges we're facing today. And I want to talk about some of the, give you some examples of those resources in the area of psychology itself, because not all psychology is confined within the, the knowledge framework that I was taught all those years ago. So let me just run briefly through some of them to, to illustrate this, this, this point. First of all, there's, there's work around anti-colonial struggle itself. And the most famous figure here, without doubt, is Frantz Fanon, coming from the Caribbean, from black communities in, in the French Caribbean, uh, eventually winding up as a significant figure in the anti-colonial struggle in North Africa. And the author of perhaps the, um, the, the most famous text of, of uh, anti-colonial uh, struggle uh, ever written. Now, Fanon was a psychologist, or very, very specifically, a psychiatrist, and, and through his, his writing from the very first to the last, there's a whole lot of psychological argument about the impact of colonialism, the nature of resistance to racism, and the consequences, the post-colonial consequences of independence and the problems of post-colonial independence states. There's a massive resource there uh, of really powerful psychological insight. And the next generation, moving now to Latin America, we see the emergence of everybody's heard of liberation theology, but there's also such a thing as liberation psychology, which has many intellectual connections with the theology, but has its own trajectory. So we have the work of people like Ignacio Martin Barro, uh, often regarded as the founder of liberation psychology and a range of people who followed that path since, Maritza Moreno, for instance. And again, a resource of psychological argument about the impact of social inequality and oppression kinds of psychological resources that are relevant to that might be developed in struggles for liberation, which are lessons that can be applied far beyond the, the region in which it first developed. Moving to South America um, and moving to the field of, of education, everybody has heard of the pedagogy of the oppressed, and I'm sure many people in this meeting have read that book by the famous Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, developing a model basically of adult literacy education, which tries to change the psychological relationship between the, 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 the person in the position of teacher 
and the, Ill, the initially illiterate adults who formed the learning community. Now, Paolo was not alone. I mean, this didn't come out of one person's brain. There was, in fact, a radical education movement internationally at the time that fed into those ideas and which have learned a great deal from them. And those, although the, the language, the rhetoric, if you like, of uh, that kind of work has changed since, the relevance of that to our thinking about, uh, about social change, I think, uh, is still, still there. And then um, there are people who've worked in what we might call post-colonial cultural politics. Um, people like the Indian psychologist Ashish Nandi, uh, the author of a brilliant historical study on the masculinities of colonial society, both among the colonizers and the colonized, but who's gone on since doing that work in, in the 1970s and 80s into a wonderfully rich and psychologically informed analysis of the dilemmas of culture and national politics in India, which is again, incredibly refreshing and interesting to read for people far beyond the, the boundaries of South Asia. Or I might mention uh, Epele Haofa working in, at the University of the South Pacific in the Pacific Islander communities who developed a cultural center um, with a rich program of creative arts in, in language, in visual arts, in music, um, which proposed in effect a, a revolutionary program for the the reconstruction, revitalization of indigenous cultures in the post-colonial context, uh, facing new and, and, and tough uh, dilemmas today. And I'm at, uh, without having names to attach to this, I could mention the importance of, of local healing practices in many parts of the world, uh, East Asia, African, parts of, of Africa, um, parts of, of South America, uh, where practices ranging from meditation to the use of psychoactive plants are parts of local knowledge formations that are constantly being applied in new circumstances. So I want to argue then that you know, being concerned with psychological issues, as I think it, we, we rightly are, there are rich resources in Southern theory which are not normally accessed through the usual search tools in the research-based knowledge formation, but with patients can be accessed and are, I think, immensely valuable. And they point us towards other goals than the narrow goals of the more formalized therapies in the global north, which very largely are directed to reinserting people into the culture of competitive individualism. So we have goals in this kind of work around healing the injuries that are done by social and global inequalities and oppressions injuries at the personal level, but also injuries at the collective and environmental knowledge. Those are valid goals. We have, um, we have the goal of implementing social justice goals, the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, or local versions of social justice goals, which always require attention to the human side, the human costs and gains of social struggle, the needs for support in the difficult struggles that we face in all the kinds of work that we've been talking about today. And finally, we have goals of, of justice in the realm of knowledge itself. Here I have to say, I disagree a little with Darren in separating epistemological thinking about an area like psychology from relational ethics, I think they are deeply connected and that it is possible to speak of epistemological justice 
through relating forms of knowledge beyond the hierarchies of the global economy of knowledge that we're most familiar with in the university world. So there are tremendous intellectual tasks here as well as practical ones. I don't for a moment underestimate the difficulty of some of this work, but there are also immense possibilities and possibilities of, of, of learning and, and joy which can be part of all the struggles that we're engaged in. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Raywan. Um, that's uh, that's uh, amazing and it's, um, it's really wonderful uh, how you have um, connected and, and named some of the sorts of um, knowledge archives that, uh, that have been exist, that, that exist, but have been excluded from, from the sorts of discourses. And I think, I mean, the idea of thinking about, um, and typically we think about Western uh, education, but to think about imperial knowledge systems is, is actually uh, quite an uh, interesting way for me to think through uh, how do we um, access these multiple uh, knowledge uh, traditions that um, is typically silenced in the global knowledge economy. Um, because I mean, knowledge production is so wrapped up into the, the capitalist <laughs> capitalist system as well as well now. So so I think there's some some really uh, deep um, food food for thought. Um, I'm really pleased that you made the connections to liberation psychology, which has been quite central to the, the community psychologies that have come out of um, the Latin American Caribbean sorts of context and have in, in, informed um, this discipline as it um, expands its own. Um, uh, resources um, um, for thinking about the sorts of challenges that it tries to engage with. Um, so, so look, um, let me not um, take up our time. So, thank you all very much for that. That's really thought provoking and really um, a rich start uh, for us. So, I just wanted to open up and see if you have any comments or reflections uh, for each other um, in terms of what's been uh, presented, and then um, I'll turn to some of the questions that have been posed on the Q and A uh, uh, function. Chris, can I just jump in there briefly? Raywin, um, that point on epistemology, we couldn't agree with you more. Um, and in fact, in the editorial for that issue, we argue that in many cultural systems, it makes no sense to separate out cosmological, existential, ethical, ontological, and epistemological issues. The issue for us is that in psychology, and particularly critical psychology, there's been such a fixation on epistemology and the nature of knowledge and, uh, and, and really, a lot of people doing that work have not really done the action side of it. So we end up in an endless conversation about the nature of knowledge rather than saying we've got to do some stuff at some point. So couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, fair enough. I think that that separation is a, a familiar one in the mainstream economy of knowledge and I, I guess all of us in different ways are trying to push past it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I obviously don't come from a psychology um, discipline at all, um, as is obvious, but um, I think listening, there are several things that really did, um, that I was able to relate to. So I, I did a PhD in um, history at the University of Melbourne and taught both Aboriginal history and Australian history for several years and I was involved for a little while in the, the infamous so-called history wars in Australia, which is relative to what people in other countries would have experienced around the time. And I think there is a, an associated point here about um, knowledges and I suppose hierarchies and, and the issue about the, and the problem of the discipline of history in Australia. And often people refer to historians seeing themselves as the aristocracy of the humanities. and. Um, what I found in Australia is historians being the most resistant discipline in the humanities to both meet challenge and change, to accept the fact that Indigenous people need not only a place at the table in universities, but gather really important outside of university structure. So even today, I think we have that battle and having our um, knowledge um, set recognised and having legitimacy in, in a university. And I think the discussion is wonderful discussion when we talked about the gardening project in New Zealand about, you know, of Indigenous people going into a university setting and learning a, a particular sort of 
set of, of knowledges and then going back to your home community and forgetting your place in a way. You know, you go back and you, you, you start thinking, well, unconsciously, I think, of imposing an epistemology on people who have their own knowledge system that's, that, that's important. So it is about balancing that, but I, I certainly um, agree with the point of, you know, we need to think of the range of approaches here and they should all have relevance. I suppose the other thing that, 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 that came up just in the, the Franz Fanon um, mentioned there, it's really important. I think that it is a seminal work. And one of the things that's happening in, in Australia, certainly in, in my part of the world, is there is a really strong interest now in notions of anti-colonialism and notions of decolonization. Again, I think both incredibly valuable. But what I think is something we need to be cautious about, I suppose, it's a bit like me saying, you know, that I'm a 63 year old man who understands my culture in many ways, but I'm going to Turtle Island, experience shocking grief after the death of my brother. Not only had I forgotten of, of ways to sustain myself, I learned new ways of, of sustaining myself. And I learned that this is, and remembered that this is a project for the rest of my life and that I'll never get to an end point. So my cultural education is a lifelong pursuit. One of the things that I see that I'm a bit anxious about is that um, I see uh, well-meaning, well-meaning, well-intentioned, younger, um, non-Aboriginal people, settler people going through sort of doing workshops and doing reading groups around texts around anti-colonialism and decolonization. And I think, unfortunately, they, they come out of a sort of, you know, a 12-week reading group having been cleansed or... You know, they know what they know and they think it's enough. And I think that we need to understand that that's only one part of an educational journey. And I, 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 I think we've all agreed with that. And that we, we do need to commit for, for, for life and we need to find ways of saying, well, what we learn in a university setting is invaluable. And so I'm not trying to diss university knowledge. It's invaluable, but it's just one aspect of our our education and we need to understand that in relationship to as I talked about the outset where is our place on country and with country and and we need to to understand that by experiencing it and I mean that in a very physical emotional way I, I the, the notion of talking again thinking about that beautiful gardening project that, that the beauty of being with other men and the the work you're doing is with the soil it's with regrowth it's not thinking that you need to, do, you know, you don't need to have an interview. You don't need to do research. You need to first be with people. I think that um, I've heard this discussion on the gardening project before, and I think it's a great example of, of that learning through being with people and valuing each other in a, in a deeply um, emotional way. I was going to say that I, I appreciate um, how you, uh, Rowan, how you um, make an emphasis on imperial knowledge, because at least in the, in the literature that I'm familiar with, uh, in terms of the colonial um, knowledges, um, even though we, uh, the, the um, elaborations are clearly placing the the discussion on relationships of historical relationships of power and, and exploitation calling it imperial instead of western highlights the imposition of the knowledge uh, instead of you know skittering it uh, moving around it and i think that is very important at this moment in time in front of the climate crisis precisely because much of the climate crisis is driven by notions about how we should live and what is a good life to be to live and um a lot of it comes from from that same imperial culture right what people aspire to and so um it is i guess it's another way of opening the conversation that is important even though you it depends again on the context. Who who are we having this conversation with? Um, I, I appreciated that you highlighted the imposition of the knowledge. Yes, I um, I think this is something that is often invisible in disciplinary knowledges. Um, 
with colleagues in, um, in Australia, South Africa and Brazil, I've been working for some years on a project on the creation, on the development of new fields of knowledge in these global south or global periphery um, societies. And one of the, um, the themes that we've been exploring and which is sort of very, very strongly present in, in the information that, that we've been given uh, is that though in many areas of interdisciplinary, even new areas of fields of knowledge like gender studies, like climate change itself, uh, like HIV AIDS, those were our case studies. Uh, although in those areas, the familiar structure of authority residing in elite institutions in the North, in the Harvards and Oxbridges and, and, and so forth, uh, that, that structure is reproduced. Nevertheless, the whole area of knowledge depends to a considerable extent on the work of intellectual workers around the post-colonial world. So it's not as if the knowledge is preformed in the North and then stamped on the rest of the world, but knowledge, I mean, there's a complex flow and appropriation of knowledge and centers of authority, but we, workers in the, in the global South, I mean, excuse the, the simplification here, actually have some power in this situation, some capacity to bargain uh, and to reshape fields of, of knowledge. And that has actually happened in some cases, for instance, in the field of HIV AIDS research, South African researchers, that's the country with the heaviest burden of, of AIDS um, uh, of any country in the world, they have actually uh, reached a position of considerable influence in the construction of knowledge in that area. So it's not as if uh, I, I never would want to, to create us uh, any implication that the people in the periphery are powerless. There is a power structure here, but it's one that is contestable and is increasingly, I think, being contested. And our discussion here, I think, has already suggested many of the possibilities in that, that kind of contestation. Thank you. I wonder if people have other comments for each other or reflections on some of the, the, the comments that have been made. before we go to questions. All right, so I'll just uh, scroll through. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. And I think the first one relates to, uh, is pointed to Marie Olga. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but it's um, talking about the idea of commons and saying that, look, it's got its roots in uh, European history as well. And, and there it is connected to the ideas of ownership and, and, and uh, possession. Um, and so the question really is about, I mean, how do you see um, that that notion um, and its interaction with um, indigenous understandings of, of land and, and and so forth. So um, um, specifically, uh, it's wondered wondered about what you thought about the tensions between that and some indigenous ways of viewing relationships to land, where country is privileged and humans serve country and see responsibility over ownership. Are the indigenous feminist ways of seeing or relation? Our relationships with lands, country, or ideas of returning to commons that you that you find valuable and useful, and that can be open to others too. I'm sure that you have some thoughts about that um, for the rest of the panel. Yeah, so um, this idea definitely has a history in Europe, but it also has many histories in in Latin America, um, and so when I bring I bring it to the fore, it's not um, as a way of picking up from that history necessarily, but to, to claim a space where we recognize that um, nature doesn't belong to anybody. We just got here, you know, 200,000 years ago, um, the last minute of the planet's history. 
and um, and and it speaks about a way of relating with land and with each other. Of course, the commons not only talk about land and what the so-called resources, right? So water, um, forest, and so on, but it 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 could also mean um, knowledge, for example, and. Um, and so when we're bringing it for into the fore is actually to talk about um, another way of relating to land and to each other that is not um, that is doesn't rest on private property. So what we're talking about is the ways in which we can and particularly in the work that I'm doing in Puerto Rico, we're creating the first agricultural land trust in Puerto Rico. And the idea is precisely for, for young farmers and other, other farmers who are invest, that are committed to agroecology to think about access to land as, a, as a, from an approach of collective rights to the land and collective responsibilities towards the land rather than finding ways in which someone can buy their own farm. Um, we're looking for ways in which we can access the land, use it and protect it and, not, and um, safeguard it for future generations, right? So we are bringing experiences and ideas that have sketchy histories in different places but we're thinking about it from the colonial standpoints and ecofeminist standpoints in the sense of caring for one another um, and being able to protect future generations as well. That being said, it's part of a bigger conversation about the, um, um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to translate in my head here, but it, it's, it's it's a bigger conversation about systemic alternatives to the climate crisis that include thinking about um, el buen vivir, degrowth, um, commoning as part of um, an ec ecology, right, of, of um, ways of thinking and being together and with nature that secure a good life for people without it being predicated on the exploitation on increasing consumption. So I'll leave it there. I don't know if other people have a, a, a comment on that. Um, if not, I'll go to the next question. Um, one, one comment, um, <clears throat> coming back to the discussion of psychology, I think the implication what Mariago was saying is that land has to become an important concept in psychology. It's something that I have argued about sociology, that um, in, when you look at sociological theory of the conventional kind, it never mentions land. How can this possibly be? Because land is the issue above all other issues in colonization. You know, it's about taking land. So the first thing that the British did when they set foot on the continent of Australia, more or less, was to plant a flag and say, this land belongs to King George. Um, now, that actually has tremendous ramifications, um, which, which we don't, uh, in the mainstream economy of knowledge, we don't have much of, way, of a way of, of grappling with. Um, but if we think about the way the consequences of relationships with land, including C, following Epele Haofa, uh, whose, whose terrific book, which I heartily recommend, is called We Are the Ocean. Um, those consequences flow through all the terrains of life that the human sciences try to speak about. So it really is not ridiculous to say that land should be an important concept in psychology. Um, thank, thank you, Raywan. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's important. I think, and, and the whole notion of land rights and self-determination and how those also go 
um, hand in hand. But I think, I mean, there's probably another sort of uh, shift, shifting, uh, shifting people as at the center of, of, our, of, our, of our thinking that goes with some of those remarks. Um, <clears throat> Or shifting the human as, as being uh, central to a lot of uh, a lot of our thinking. Um, I'm uh, I've got another question here that um, unless others have uh, reactions to that uh, initial comment around commons um, uh, that Darren and Peter it's directed at you, but I think it ties in with what other people have said and also what Tony have said in terms of being with um, and this notion of relational ethics and how it sits alongside the university's agenda of knowledge. Um, uh, knowledge creation um, as one of its 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 key uh, its key functions. Um, do you think that knowledge creation is an illusion uh, anyway? So we don't need to worry about it too much, or is that a second secondary to respectful processes or something else? Sure. Um, no, I don't think um, knowledge uh, the knowledge creation is an illusion because knowledge that we produce has very real implications. Um, for the communities um, that said knowledge is kind of applied to. Um, but I do take the point around um, this maybe this idealized pure form of knowledge production. I do think um, more and more um, peoples around the world, particularly indigenous and uh, minoritized communities are becoming disillusioned by knowledge that is pure methodologically, but practically um, doesn't have too much to offer. Um, in terms of the relational ethics and sitting alongside the notion of knowledge production, I think this does link to the point um, that Raywan was um, raised around the separation of ethics and knowledge. And um, to answer that point, um, you know, one of the key things that we tried to communicate within our presentation is this idea of research, um, sorry, relationships first, research second. And what, but what we mean by that is that the knowledge that we seek to produce emerges through our ethical engagement with others. Um, you and know, that makes it actionable. Yeah, and that makes it actionable because you know, um, some of the homeless people that we were working with do not give interviews, but through engaging with them for six months, we were able to get beyond the sort of public account of, you know, um, these people get interrogated by police or caseworkers, and they just kind of say what they need to say to kind of go about their day. Um, but by fronting up for, for six weeks, by involving ourselves in collective action and retexturing the earth and doing gardens and all these sorts of things, I mean, this is inherently um, central to the production of knowledge. So it's not this kind of separate sort of thing. Um, we have published a bit around how these philosophical divines are very much sort of anchored in a sort of ancient Greek philosophical tradition. And for many um, other indigenous and different cultural groups, it is tricky to talk across these, these boundaries because they exist within the scholarship of someone else, but we're expected to put our philosophical arguments on that very fundamentally non-Maori, non-Indigenous um, way of doing things. So, um, yeah, well, that's basically my thoughts. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Tony or others, do you have a... Yeah, a um, yeah while I was listening um, to the conversation just there, it, um, it raises a, a very personal issue, but I think it's pertinent to the I whole idea of, of knowledge production. And so I've finished work, as you know, Chris, um, you're gonna miss me greatly. Um, I finished work and um, I'm thinking of what some of the things I'll do next and some of the stuff I will do will be to work on, you know, to help care for country here in um, Melbourne on Wurundjeri country, working with probably the Wurundjeri Tribal Council, obviously on a voluntary basis. And also I have an ongoing relationship of doing work with homeless people um, in regard to writing practice. And one of the things I've been thinking, which, which may sort of throw a spanner in the works here of what we do in universities, one of the first thoughts I've had is that I'll be able to do all this work knowing that I won't be documenting any of it. I don't have to think about it in that way. I won't have a notebook. I won't have to go back to my office and put notes down. I, I won't be thinking about an academic outcome. And, and again, I'm not being disrespectful to, to academics at all because I've been one for a long time. But I feel, I feel relieved of that because what I'll be doing, I hope, is finding a way to be part of a community. Now, again, thinking of the wonderful gardening project that we've been talking about, it is about be becoming part of a community and respecting um, the people that you're working with. I, and I think that's wonderful and ethical. But I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that I won't be gathering knowledge external to my own learning. And I, I, I think it, it's something I feel really excited about. 
that are not producing secondary knowledge. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tony. I think that's, uh, I mean, that's that's so important and such a real tension for us as the university faces its own crises and, and um, centers particular sorts of um, uh, indicators of success and all of that. So we've got some real challenges in in the university itself. Uh, look, I'm just conscious of time that we have, we have actually come to the end of <laughs> to the to the end of our time, and and, and I think that we've got some slack. Um, links and channels that where we can continue this conversation. But I just wanted to read one comment that I've been posted and then close our session. And this, this comment comes from um, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Stark, who's sit, sitting up in Germany. And he says, um, and I totally agree with him, that he really appreciate the discourse that you are all bringing up here for community psychology to realize there are different kinds of knowledge beyond imperial knowledge is desperately needed, not only on a global scale, but also within regions, implicit and tacit knowledge is an important form of indigenous knowledge in Europe, and also which is needed to be recognized by community psychology. So I think what you have done and what you've offered and given us and the sorts of foundations you've laid is um, really opening up uh, for us to, to have a discussion about what, what are, and, and I think Ray, when you mentioned this in one of the papers that you circulated, I mean, what are the ways in which we actually democratize some of these um, knowledge systems? What are the sorts of ways in which we um, value the different ways in which knowledges can be produced um, in partnership with um, and through relational ethics and through other and alternative ways of relating with people? So I think these are really, really um, fundamentally deep, um, important sort of shifts that it's um, inviting um, for, for us to engage with um, locally, but um, as Wolfgang and others and all of you have said, um, across the different sorts of boundaries, and you've all mentioned the sorts of ways in which you are linking across uh, across borders, across places, but then also this panel itself as an example of interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity and the possibilities um, that, that gets opened up with having this sort of conversation and then to think critically. And then also, I think the important part to act um, in, in the service of addressing some of the sorts of challenges in particular in the way that they are expressed locally, but also connected to the global inequalities that are ravaging so many communities at the moment. So I want to close it there and thank you very much for your contribution and setting us up on a very um, exciting couple of days in Zoom. And I hope that I can figure out how to get my sound sorted out. So thank, so thank, so thank you all for, for joining us this morning and look forward to seeing you uh, in other spaces. Thank you. And hold up. Hey. Uh, where are we? Oh, hold on. Just thank uh, you. Oh, was this a private room, is it? Have you unmuted us? Yeah, no, we're unmuted. Hey, it was really nice. Hello. Oh, someone's sharing your screen. <laughs> I'm trying to get to the Slack. <laughs> the Slack, yeah, the Slack room, which 